Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Good morning, church. All right, y'all awake today. Good, good. You ready? Ish. I hope you're ready. If not, I mean, I don't know what to tell you because I'm ready. Begin. All right. Uh, If this is your first time here, I'm glad you're here. My name is Jared Cochran. Uh, I'm I'm excited that you're here, for one, if you're a, uh, a regular member or if it's your first time here, buckle up. Uh, if somebody invited you, buckle up, but uh, it's going to get real. We are in the middle of a series called Contend. We're walking through the letter of Jude. If you have no idea what that is, that's because, uh, as you were saying earlier with uh, pastors and politics, not that this has anything to do with politics, but uh, a lot of pastors are not going to be preaching Jude. Even though it's only 25 short verses, uh, it's, it's very harsh, it's very eye-opening, it's very urgent. So we are in episode three. Today we are going to be in verses eight to 10 for the note takers. And just to, uh, to throw a title on there, I'm just gonna call it They Do Not Understand. They Do Not Understand. It's, it's from the text. Uh, I, I found that the deeper I've been going with these messages and, and focusing less on relying on anything other than God and the Holy Spirit. Uh, The titles, I don't really think of a title anymore (laughs) until we get here. But uh, today I'm praying for for just for eyes to open. Um, I'm gonna bring you back first though. You don't have to flip there. I think they have it on the screen. I've got a lot of scripture today even though it's just those three verses. But I wanna open with... um, why we need to contend, because you'll see in Jude's day, and it was written in 65 AD, uh, Jude, and in the first verse of Jude, he, is no, uh, he notes himself as a servant of Jesus Christ, but a brother of James. And if you don't know, James is Jesus' brother, thus Jude is Jesus' brother, but he is more concerned about being the servant of Christ than being a family member of Christ, if you will. Now, obviously, if you're saved, we are all, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We're all baptized into Christ. We're all grafted into that family. If you're not saved, if you're an atheist, I'm glad you're here. You do belong before you believe. Jesus says, come as you are, and then you clean up. If you've been anywhere else and they've church hurt you, I'm sorry. That won't really happen here, but you cannot go anywhere without getting hurt. Uh, and this isn't in my notes, but he, he's mentioned it before with church hopping. That was not a thing back in the Bible. They were like several hundred miles apart. So you couldn't just leave and go to another one and spread discord and false doctrine and false gospel there. It was, it was designed so that if you were excommunicated or you were kicked out of the church because of sinful ways, you were supposed to feel the, the struggle of losing that community. So you couldn't just run down the street and jump into another place. You had to try to, if you wanted to repent, if you felt the need to repent, you needed to try to get back in good graces. You had to, the whole thing about repentance and getting back in good graces, not just with God, but also with the church. So (laughs) Isaiah chapter 30, and this is why we need to contend because we're living in much the same time with rebellious reprobates that uh, want to twist God's word and want to just cotton candy Christianity. You know the spiel. They just ignore the word and they tell you whatever you want to hear. I'm never going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm only gonna tell you what you need to hear because that's how you get to heaven. That is how you get to God. That's how you get closer to God. You don't get closer by being comfortable. You get closer by being consecrated. That's not something a lot of people like. Jesus did the same thing. Ah, I should have grabbed my phone. Uh, For all the people that think Jesus was just weak and woke, he literally said from his own mouth that he came uh, not so much for peace, but to cause division. He came with a sword. It would pit pit two against three and three against two in the household. Father against son, daughter against mother. This word 
is the dividing line between good and evil. There is no morally gray area. It is black and white. That is all there is. If you try to water it down and put a little bit of of white in with the black, you get gray, and that's called compromise. That's called uh, false doctrine. So we don't do that here. We're hungry, and we're seeking God, and we're pressing in. So Isaiah 30, specifically verse 9 through 11. For they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord. Whoops. Sounds like now. Who say to the seers, do not see. And that's hard to see because I forgot to blow the text up. (laughs) And to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Hold that. Speak to us smooth things. Tell us what tickles our ears and makes us feel good. Tell us what will make us come back next Sunday. Tell us what will get us behind the church. Tell us what drives us to feel like we're going to be blessed and prosperous. And as soon as we hear prosperous, we immediately think it's prosperity coming from money instead of blessing, which in the Bible was happiness. Tell us nice things. Prophesy illusions. What is this? Tell us lies. Lies. If it's not coming out of here and you can't test it from this book, if you can't test it against God's holy, I am fired up already, so y'all better be ready. If you are not coming from this book, if it is not tested against this word and it falls apart, it is a lie. You see this in schools. Y'all can tell. Oh, you know what? Let me give you 11. Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more. Oh, my goodness. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. We are still in those times. The Bible is not just a historical book. It is not what has happened. It is what always happened. This will continue to happen. That's why you can read it uh, three months into your Christian walk and 30 years into your Christian walk, and you'll still get something out of it because it speaks to you. It is living. It is active. It is alive. It pierces your very soul because... God's DNA is within you. It's structured in you so that you know there's a creator in heaven. And he pulls you to him. The Bible says that he reconciles the world to himself. So we see these things in schools. We see these things when you go to street preachers. And then you have Christians come up and they say, well, God told me to tell you to stop. God told me to tell you to shut up. You're not doing anything right here. You're not helping anybody out. This is just a Christmas parade. This is just a Halloween party. This is just a Valentine's Day. Say what you will. God sends people there. He said, Matthew 19, 28, go into all the world. Thank you, Tanya. She gonna wake y'all up. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's not just in your house. That's not just in this church. That's not just at your job. That is everywhere you go. Go to these events and preach the word. So now we have two things on the cusp, on the cusp of revival with Jesus coming back and time is running out. And now we have the two, the dividing line has never been more clear, never been wider. And so we have people either rejecting God and running away from him when you start hearing just unfiltered truth, because we haven't heard it in so long, we're so anemic that as soon as we start hearing the truth, it's hard for us to wake up because we've been asleep for so long. So we run from God and we reject him, or we wake up and we are revived, we are shocked back to life by the truth, and we run to him. Those are your two responses. You either reject or you run to God. There is no middle ground, and if you are not chasing after God you're falling back. Whatever is alive has to keep moving forward. It has to keep growing. You cannot stay stagnant. There is no stagnant Christian. There is no stale Christian. Those are called dead Christians. Ooh, heavy, ouch. Truth. 
So Jude, and we'll get there in a minute, Jude gives us this warning all about false prophets, and he speaks with a lot of urgency, and he's very clear on it. And what is amazing is you can go all the way back to Deuteronomy 18.20, where God says that the Old Testament, the Old Testament's punishment for false prophets, for leading people, uh, leading people astray was literally they were supposed to be killed. That is how serious this is. I'm not calling for the murder of people. I'm not calling for the murder of false prophets. We do live under a new covenant, but we should be honoring that covenant. We should be preaching that covenant. We should not be altering that covenant. We should not be watering down that covenant. We should be preaching the word and just the word, adding nothing to it and nothing taken away from it. If you want to see how serious this is in Matthew 7, 13, this is on the screen, Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. He is the gate. He is the door. He is knocking. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. Which gate did he say to go through? The narrow gate. But the wide gate is easy. Oh, I just want it easy in church, pastor. Quit stepping on my toes. Quit preaching sin. Quit talking about all this stuff. Quit screaming. I just want to sit down and be comfortable and be easy. That's called the wide gate. That leads you to destruction. And those who enter it, this is very unfortunate, are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is what? 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 That leads to life. Amen. I'm going to wake y'all up. And those who find it are few. Next verse. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Jesus, and this is going to be very offensive, <laughs> but it applies to me. So I'm saying this about myself. Do you know why he calls us sheep? Sheep are dumb. Sheep are stupid. They are not intelligent animals. They are prone to wandering, and they are prone to biting. Each other, when you get them crowded around each other, they start nipping at each other and being angry at each other, but they are not intelligent animals. And (laughs) ravenous wolves, wolves, Where where this took place, this illustration would be so real to the people because they would understand that when the sheep left the flock and they got alone, the wolves would go after that. The wolves go after those that disconnect from the body of Christ, those that say, I don't really like that church anymore. I'm gonna go over here. Or you know what? I can have Jesus, but I don't really need church. They disconnect from the body. And then within a few months or a few years, they have compromised so much that the ravenous wolves have taken their fangs and bit into them and destructively killed them. And they do not know any better. So Jesus says, watch out because they are wolves in sheep's clothing. What does this mean? They look like you. They talk like you. They sound like you. They act like you. They are clever. They know what to say. That is why they trick you. They give you just enough little bit of truth, and then they twist it. And then a little bit later down the line, suddenly you find yourself saying that Jesus is not Lord, that you're denying the deity. You're denying Christ, thinking you can live in immorality and keep your sin Oh, y'all ain't ready for this. Good. And in Matthew 24, we're almost to Jude. (laughs) I don't think, I didn't put this on the screen. Uh, Verses three through 13, this is the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him, what are the signs of the end times? You've heard me say it time and time again. Time is running out. Your days are numbered. My days are numbered. I pray and I hope that Jesus comes back before we all uh, before we have to experience anything, but we don't know. So we are warned in the Word to not remain idle, to not be stagnant. You have to keep doing things 
That's why they got rebuked in the Bible times because when they heard that Jesus was coming back, they just started neglecting all of their jobs and all of their duties and just started to be lazy. And his first words when they ask him, what are the signs of the end times? His first words are, see that you are not deceived. It's real. It's real. It's real. And then he gives them the signs. Number one, religious deception. That's the first one he brings up. The wolves in the sheep's clothing. Number two, armed conflict, wars and rumors of wars, and natural disasters will increase. And it says, this is the birthing pains. The beginning of the birthing pains. It's going to get worse. It doesn't get better until we get up there and are blessed by seeing our Lord and Savior in person. Number three, persecution will increase. Where's it at? Verse nine. I'm in 23. I'm like, that ain't right. That's not the right verse. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be what? Hated. Hated. That's the people, that's how you know who to read in the word. Hated by all nations for my name's sake. And this is it, y'all, 10. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many will abandon the church. There will be mistreatment in church. There will be hatred in church. There will be division in church. And love and compassion will fade away. People will begin to hate each other. Families will be, uh, begin to hate each other and they will be fighting. But the best part is effective evangelism. Oh, wait. Y'all didn't believe me. And many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Compassion dies. But the one who endures to the end woo, will be saved. That is why you need to contend for the faith. That's why you got to stand on the word. That's why you got to keep pressing in and getting closer to Jesus to endure and be saved. Verse 14, and the gospel of the kingdom hmm, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Amen. See y'all next week. Just kidding. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come here. It is, it is by no coincidence or mistake that today is also a day of communion and baptism. God, that your word says in Colossians that we will be putting them, burying them symbolically in the water and they will be raised to life in Christ. Their sins will be wiped away. The blood of Jesus will make them whole. The blood of Jesus will make them spotless. They will be a new creation. You are doing a new thing. You are doing a new thing. You are stirring your saints up and you are changing the world. You are reconciling the world to yourself. You are stirring fire in our hearts. So God, we ask you and we invite you here. Wreck the agenda. Wreck the platform. Wreck the programs. Woo! Mm. Gotta open my eyes to pray. Ah, Holy Spirit, I am a vessel. Use me as your voice. Wipe me out of the way. Let me get out of the way and let our focus be eternally on you and in the mighty and in the majestic and in the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody said, amen. amen. So we know that Jude has called us. Jesus has called us. Jude reminds us of this and he gives us the reminding and he tells us that we are beloved, we are called, we are kept. This means we are all charged and called to share the gospel, to do it. And this is not just that you are uh, supposed to do it, but that you are already equipped to do it. 
already equipped. And people wonder if churches don't, uh, if we don't have classes and growth track and all this stuff to walk people through what to do and new believers and what to do. And I think about the woman at the well who came in and came and met Jesus. No, no. He was already there. She's going there because she can't go there any other time. And Jesus is, <laughs> Jesus is already there waiting on her. She comes to him at a routine place, comes to him at a routine area, comes to him as she is, and he meets her, and she transforms him. All right, he transforms her, sorry. <laughs> Woo, almost got heretical. She's not trained. She is transformed. He makes her new. And she immediately goes out and shares the faith with the entire town and says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Everything. Her faith moved the gospel forward. She didn't just keep it to herself. She is made whole, and she doesn't withhold that like we do in the American church because we got saved but the white people, they don't want as many black people to get saved. Or the black people, they don't want as many white people to get saved. Or we don't want the Mexicans to get saved. We, don't, we got this whole cultural war because in the United States, where we are divided and pitted against each other because our whole political system is designed, are, are you left or are you right? There is no left or right in heaven. There is up and down. You are either going up to heaven or going down to eternal damnation. So Jude is telling us to have an ongoing defense of the gospel, to keep contending for the faith. And these disputes have been going on, you read the New Testament, because some people subtract from the word and some people supplement to the word. So you have cultural compromise because we like to fit in. So we change the word and we water down the word to fit with the world. And we start pruning the gospel instead of letting the gospel prune us. Instead of letting Jesus and asking Asking, asking, praying, Jesus, remove the sin from my life. Prune me in your refining fire. Don't let me stay how I am. We decide, well, I'll just twist it. I'll rip out that page of the Bible and continue doing what I want to do because, well, God will forgive me. And we abuse grace. Or we add to it with, watch this little word, and. And. The Christians, we say Jesus. Catholics say Jesus and Mary. Christians, we say we are saved by Christ alone, and Catholics say you are saved by Jesus and your works. Do you see how we get deceived and tricked into adding or subtracting from the Bible. But Jude tells us that the faith was once for all delivered to you. It is entrusted to you. It is unchanging. You cannot change it. God is unchangeable. The gospel is unchangeable. So you need to be unshakable. You need to be unsinkable. You need to be unreachable because God is in you. He is supremely holy. He has given you your word to study. Giving you his word to study. But now we live in a time, again with false prophets, that know how to cherry pick verses out of the word for illustration, but never instruction. You can go in the locker room of any high school and see, I can do all things. And we cut off the Christ who strengthens me. But we also forget that Paul was in prison as he wrote this. But we like to just apply it. So, hey, I can bench press 225 because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we quote it for illustration, but we never study it and apply it for instruction to walk through our life. 
So now we have all of these weak Christians, these cotton candy Christians that sugarcoat everything to make it easier to swallow as if the gospel needs to be any easier. No, it's supposed to be hard. That's why narrow is the gate. And many fall into deception. Many will go to hell because it's too hard to swallow the truth. Why? Because we want to be prideful and rejectful. We don't want God's word. That's the whole reason why we don't read God's word. And it sits on the floorboard of our car and on a dresser and collects dust. That's why, (laughs) I'm gonna step on the toes. That's why last week and earlier, twice now, we can shout about when we bring up the Democratic Party and Kamala Harris and how they're killing babies and all that and everybody can shout and we can say, oh, Jesus is the only one on the throne and it doesn't matter who's in office because God is supremely holy and everybody will shout And the minute I'm like, hey, sin is bad, this is evil, you need to get in God's word, cricket, silence. Priorities, people, not politics. Priorities. But we are cultural beings, so we are naturally inclined to twist things and to compromise. That's why we preach soft so people will stay instead of preaching truth so people will be saved. That's why we preach soft to fill seats and not truth to feed the soul. They slip in. They slip in deceptively. They are on assignment. And we treat them just like, oh, it's okay. And we like their posts on Instagram. And we like the shorts on YouTube. And we like the little quotes on Facebook. And we send them money. And we buy their books. And we don't test them. We don't test them. We don't test them. We don't test them. We do not test them. They got a title, so we don't test them. Test me. Go home and test me. Good. Good. So the, prof, the, the false prophets sound pleasing, and we get to Jude, and he shout, sounds harsh, he sounds narrow, and he sounds dangerous. He sounds dangerous because the dominion of darkness has had a stronghold over the American church for so long that this sounds dangerous because it is. It's dangerous to the dominion of darkness. So when it steps on your toes, when it cuts you like a sword, when it convicts your soul and you feel the fire of the Holy Spirit within you, you know God is moving. If you can listen to a sermon and hear and feel nothing and get nothing out of it, and you're not driven to want to press deeper and soak in his word and just read his word and be in his presence, it's doing nothing for you but rotting your soul out. Let's get in it. 30-minute intro. Don't worry, I'll, y'all get the, the, the restaurant on time. Verse 8, yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Stop. In like manner, everything before this, they are doing the same, doing the same thing. Now, what did we learn last week? We talked about the demons that left heaven. They did not... stay in their own position of authority. They left their proper dwelling. That's verse six. And he has kept them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And then we learned about Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, how they indulged in sexual immorality. And now we see these people are also the same. They're relying on their dreams. Defiling the flesh. They're relying on their dreams, their ambitions, their goals, their agendas. This is not, they come up to you and they tell you that they heard from a spirit or spirit, like we can't say the definitive holy spirit. They're hearing from a spirit, not the spirit, not the third of the Godhead, not the one in the Trinity. He is not an it. He is a person with personality, with feelings, and he lives inside of you. He seals you when you come to Christ. 
and then they defile the flesh. Now, I don't need to go back into all of the sexual immorality stuff. I'm sure we'll get there. But they walk by flesh, not by faith. You remember years ago, Jay-Z was shown wearing a shirt that said, do what thou wilt. Do what you want to do. This is a quote from Aleister Crowley, who was an occultist. If you haven't heard of him, you don't need to look him up unless you want to test me. You make sure it's true. I don't really care. But he was an, uh, an occultist, and he, he taught this thing <clears throat> called Thelema. Thelema is Greek for choice or will. Now, where do we know that word from? Matthew 6, 10. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. So Thelema now, how the devil counterfeits what God creates, he takes the satanic way and he says, my will be done. Do what you want to do. Cast off all restraint. There is no rules under this thing called Thelema. They say you can pursue anything as long as it doesn't interfere with someone else's pursuit of what they're doing. I don't know if that sounds as ridiculous to you as it does to me because you cannot pursue anything without it affecting someone else. You can't. They promote sexual liberation. This is disgusting. They say it teaches take your fill and will of love as you will when, where, and with whom you want. It's called rape. That is demonic deception. That is the lust of the flesh, and then they try to tell you and rope you in with secret knowledge. If you are under any teacher, especially of the Bible, and they suddenly have a revelation that no one has had before, and it sounds nothing like what has came from the word of God. That is not new revelation. That is demonic deception. That is a false prophet. There is nothing new under the sun. There's nothing I can preach that has not been preached before. I might say it differently, but it has already been said. So there is nothing new. And they reject. They defile the flesh. This is them rejecting God's authority, and then they end up naturally rejecting natural authority, which is man's authority, the law. We see this now so much because everybody hates cops. And not that they're all good because there's some boneheads, but that's everywhere in life. It doesn't matter. But they reject God's authority first, and then that ultimately leads them to reject man's authority. And when you reject these two things, that leads you to no restraint. That makes everything free game. That's why you've got three-year-olds standing on the table in Chili's cussing out their parents. That's why you've got teachers fighting students, fist fighting in school. That's why you've got kids in broad daylight trying to rob you and steal things when you're just at the park. It says they uh, blaspheme the glorious ones. Now is when we go deep. Are you ready? I'm probably going to have to read a lot of this off of here, so I'm sorry if I don't just jump up. I'll calm down. They blaspheme the glorious ones. This is angels. And in verse 9, but when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now we know Michael does this for one reason, because the power doesn't come from him, it comes from God. That's why he says, the Lord rebuke you. Now, if you have been here in this series, you know that the demons who are 
angels that rejected God and his authority, they have been cast down. Some roam the earth. A third of the heaven, uh, a third of the angels in heaven did this. There was a war before time, and then they got cast down to earth. Some are already in chains, some are not. They roam the earth seeking whom they can devour. So Michael, being the archangel, and he is still godly, he's still in heaven, he still has authority, okay? The demons don't have any. They don't care. <laughs> so they will blaspheme God. They will blaspheme God. They don't care. They will slander God. They will slander you. They don't care. Angels will not do this. They will stay in their authority. They will not slander. That's why he says, the Lord rebuke you to not slander Satan. So then you have the false prophets who also assume an authority that they do not have. Why? Because they do not have the Holy Spirit within them. They have no authority other than what you give them. By listening to them, by watching them, by soaking it in your head, by opening your checkbook and writing checks to them while giving them cash and buying their books, buying their clothing line, going and listening to all their conferences where they tell you this is the year of favor and do X, Y, Z and God's going to bless you with this. But the only person prospering from that ministry is the false prophet. You've been listening to four years, three years, ain't nothing changed. So we remember from last week that Jesus has all authority. He said it. All authority has been given to me, and then we are given that authority through the Holy Spirit. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have, re- I, people don't want to believe this, you have resurrection power within you. You can raise the dead. The only reason we don't is because we lack the faith. So we're given authority. Oh, let's go. We're going to go in the whole book. Genesis 1. I don't even have enough bookmarks. 27, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. You are created. That's not the right one. You are created in his image. Verse 28. That one's coming up in a minute. I'm glad you were ready. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. (laughs) Be fruitful and multiply. Sounds a lot like Matthew 28, 19, where you are supposed to go into all the world and multiply, make disciples. We've been hearing it from the beginning and neglecting it the entire existence of humanity. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heaven and watch this over every living thing that moves on the earth. Every living thing that moves on the earth. Back in verse 2, I'll I'll read it to you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. In the original language, it is known as chaotic nothingness. And darkness was over the face of the deep. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And he saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. This is physically darkness and light. And it is spiritually darkness and light. Darkness was already hovering over the face of the deep. The demons were already in the earth before you were, before Adam was, before Eve was, before the light was. Because they were already cast down. So God says, let there be light, and he separates it. And then man comes, and we saw verse 28, that man gets dominion over what? Over what? 
every, every, every living thing that moves on the earth. Y'all think demons are dead? No, they are alive and active. So you have dominion over the demons. You have the authority to cast them down in Jesus' name. I don't know why you're not excited about that. They're coming against you and wanting to kill you. They're wanting to shove you into the ground. They're wanting to pull you down into hell because they will never see heaven. They hate you. 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 They hate hate every single thing about you because they hate God and you were made in his image. They were not. So because you have the Holy Spirit, you have dominion. Now watch this, dominion in verse 28. We are given dominion over every living thing that moves on the earth. That is when we entered the war. Newsflash, you are in a war. You are in a spiritual war. And all the way back in Genesis, we entered it. But (laughs) it was not until the cross and the sacrifice of Christ when Jesus came down from heaven, rejected his throne, and came down to be fully man, fully God, and became broken and beaten and mocked and destroyed and hung on a rough piece of wood and destroyed for your sins and rose again so that you would have eternal life. That is when you were given the authority and the ability to fight back. So you are in the war and you've got to fight back in the war. Y'all, they are a lot more passionate than I am on fighting. So don't watch me scream at you and slap this. Go out and do something. Don't nobody want to hear that. Don't nobody want to shout about that. I just want to keep coming to church and keeping it easy. Nah. Nah. So the the false prophets, let's get back to Jude. The false prophets, they reject God's authority, so it's not within them. Because God is not within them. Then they end up disregarding and belittling the power and the influence of the demonic. They blaspheme by trying to rebuke demons and rebuke other things in their own name or their own authority because they do not have the authority of the Holy Spirit within them. So they belittle it, and then Jude literally says they regard it too lightly, like we do. I don't like when he drops the book. I don't like when he slaps the book. We regard it too lightly. That is a sword. I will take it up, and I will cut you. I will cut anyone else that needs it because they need conviction, because they need to be saved. They don't need to be coddled. They don't need to be comfortable. They need to be saved, and to be saved, you got to be aware of your sin. Yes. That's right. Amen. If you are unaware of your sin, you are not saved. And worse, if you are aware of your sin and you want to stay in it, woe to you. Y'all think woe like a horse. No, woe. Bad. No good. Worst place to be. We'll see this later in Jude, twice dead. That is not the second death mentioned in Revelation. Getting ahead. Where we at? They regard it too Oh, The false prophets, they regard the demons too lightly. They belittle them. They cannot resist them. So what happens? If you cannot resist something, eventually you will submit to that something. If you cannot resist the demons, if you cannot resist your sin, eventually you are going to submit to your sin. You can resist God. You can resist Jesus. You can resist Jesus on earth. But guess what? When you get to heaven, 
or not, you cannot resist him anymore. There is no rejection in eternity. This is your only time to do it. When you get there, if you know your word, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You will have no choice but to confess that he is God. There is no atheist in hell. There is no Muslim in hell. There is no Buddhist in hell. They're all believers. They're there because they weren't. But then you see God and now you believe. That's why a lot of people, they will get there. The most depressing verse in the Bible Many have called on his name. He will say, depart from me, I never knew you. The worst thing is to be in a church assuming and not reading the word for yourself, not testing the scriptures against whatever pastor or prophet or bishop or apostle that you're under, and you just blindly believe it and then be led into eternal damnation because you had no fortitude. Men, <laughs> so you just accept it, and then we get we get deceived. I hate that. I hate that. I physically that makes me sick. That there's churches all over this country. He said it earlier. Only only two percent get over two hundred people. Their influence remains small, so they can't cause damage. But then you also, and this is not, my God, this is not every large church. Some of these people, they have large platforms because of their charisma. Because literally, like the entertainment industry, they have the demonic backing them and moving things there so they can twist gospel and twist people into what they want them to believe. And it's simply just moving forward, not by ministry, but by man. And they're deceiving people. They are deceiving people and they know no better because we just are biblically illiterate. We are the sheep without a shepherd. But if you believe in him and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And if you believe in Jesus, you will enter into eternity and worship him forever. But if you reject him here, you will get there, there, not there, there, and you will not be worshiping him. You will have a very, 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 very long time to go through every stage of grief. And instead of like here in the physical where you can go through those stages and come out a better person, instead of letting it eat you, there is no returning. So you will go through anger at God because you are there. Why didn't the loving God let you into his heavenly gates? I believed in Jesus. Well, you didn't live for Jesus. You know them by their fruit. I said, Lord, Lord, but you didn't do anything for him. Your fruit was rotten. So you will go through the anger and you will hate God and you will go, I don't even know all the stages. You'll go through the depression. You'll go through the denial. And then eventually you're just stuck with weeping and gnashing of teeth in a body that cannot die but will want to. For a worm that will eat you inside and out, but never destroying you completely. And you will feel every inch, every single bite, every flame, everything. You will feel that, and it will never end. But you don't have to. But you don't have to. There is a God. There is a God who loves you and set it down before creation even began. He already put it in motion as the, ah, as the plan to send his son. Jesus 
already chose to die for you before you were even here, before the earth was even formed. He was the lamb that was slain before creation. Do you, do you grasp that? God, he knew that we would reject him. He knew that there would be drag queens in school trying to indoctrinate your children. He knew there would be perverts after your children. He knew there would be the demonic in office. He knew that we would sin and sin and sin and sin and love him and sin and love him and sin. And he still chose to create the earth. He knew all of it before it happened, and he still said, I'm going to do it. And then he reconciled us to. He knew every deep, dark, disgusting, single thing about you, every inch, every, the, oh, man, your hair is numbered. Do you think about that? Men, when you get in the shower after your wife and you're picking the little fur balls off of the wall or off of the floor, do you think that she's counting? Kelsey doesn't do that, but that was... <laughs> I've seen the memes. I'm going to thank my wife's girl. I'm, I am. You don't do that. I do it. I'm just kidding. All right. I got to hurry. 10 minutes. What? Okay. <laughs> Where am I? No. Well, yes. Here we go. All right. In Jude 9, this is the other side. This is where we're, we're diving deeper. And if y'all don't shout about this, I mean, Jesus needs to get a grip on you. And we'll baptize you after church. <clears throat> so I'm drawing a blank on the name of the book that Jude is quoting where he's talking about Moses contending, or Moses, where he's talking about Michael contending over the body of Moses with Satan, the accuser. So that book is missing, but it has been, uh, there was an attempt at reconstructing it. Back when they had part of it, I, 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 they had some of it, whatever. So the story that goes from the reconstruction is that Satan, the accuser, is accusing Moses of slander, of murder because, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, he's accusing him of slander because of his angry disobedience to God when he struck the rock for water and when he murdered a man before he was called. And Satan says, Moses, like he does with you and I, Moses, Jared, Tanya, Julie, Gabby, Tia, Stephen, all of you, he says, <laughs> You should, I could, I don't want to spend every time. He says, you should not be allowed in heaven. Now, oh, this is going to step on some toes. Michael, he is an angel. So is Satan. Michael is thought to maybe have agreed with that mentality that Moses shouldn't have been in heaven because sin cannot be in heaven. Now, to prove this, we can go in Zechariah chapter 3, and I'll just read verse 1 and 2. This is in God's Word, recorded in God's Word. He says, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand? Is this not a branch? And you will see this in Jude, or if you've already done your homework, you've seen this. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Is this not someone who was sinful? Is this not someone who was destined for demonic depression? Is this not someone who was destined to eat the flames and be in eternal damnation forever? But were they not plucked from the fire? Yes. Now Joshua was standing before the angel. Let me back up. 
verse one, the angel of the Lord. This is a uh, theophany, and I probably botched that saying. This is Christ pre-incarnate. When you see angel of the Lord, it's Jesus in the Old Testament. Why didn't they just say Jesus? Because he wasn't born yet. He wasn't called Jesus yet. And the angel stood before, uh, now Joshua was standing before the angel, before Jesus, before God, clothed with filthy garments. Now, if you don't know this passage, this is when they are coming from exile and they are (laughs) cleaning house. Cleaning house. They are reforming and rebuilding the temple. They're cleaning up the church. They're trying to preach truth to clean up the spiritual aspect of the church. Not just the building because we, you, are the church. So we need to rebuild. We need to reform. We need to get out of the mindset of comfortability and into consecration. We need to step farther away from the world and be on our face before Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So they're rebranding it. And Jude has paralleled this passage. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, behold, I, God, have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with pure vestments. Jude, when he brings this up and parallels this passage, he is showing Satan's accusation both times <laughs> were legally correct. These are and were, well, they were, not are, because they're in eternity now. They were sinful men. Sinful men and women should not be in heaven. We cannot be in heaven. That's why people died in the Old Testament uh, if they got into the wrong part, the, 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 the most holy of holies in the temple because sin cannot enter the supreme holiness of God. It cannot commingle. God cannot <laughs> commingle with sin. So he says, with the filthy clothes, these men are unfit to perform God's work. Now, both sides, in the story in Zechariah, in the story in Jude, Michael stands aside. Why? These men are legally charged with being sinful. That is correct. They should not be in heaven. But God made the law. And only the one who made the law gets to decide who gets to serve and who is fit to serve. God uses who he chooses. He calls who he wants to call. He does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. There's not a single person in the Bible apart from Jesus Christ that was qualified for any services. Uh, Moses was a murderer. David was also a murderer and an adulterer. Samson, I'll say it again like I said it in the beginning, Samson was chasing tail all after the women, trying to get that body count up. Sinful men, and God used them. He chose them, and then he gave them what they needed to do With their job, with their task, he didn't say, hold on, you need about three years of schooling. You need about four years of experience. I'm going to charge you with this, and we're going to run forward and proclaim the gospel. And you're going to tell people about me. You're going to lead people to me. You're going to preach the truth about me. And they will either reject you 75% of the time and a few will be led to glory. God, God, 
God made the law. So Moses, oh, I gotta say this right. God decides who's fit to serve. God decides that Satan is banished, and then he removes the curse of the law. You should shout about that. You should shout about that. He has removed the curse of the law. He has removed the curse that you were charged with. This wasn't just Moses. This wasn't just Joshua. This is you being accused of your sin, which you are sinful. I am sinful. But God, in his patience and in his glory, changed that. So see, this isn't so much Michael avoiding slander of Satan. It is more accurate to say that uh, Satan is slandering Moses for his disobedience. So Michael says, you don't get to do that. You don't get to do that. I don't get to do that. You do not get to do that. I know a lot of self-righteous Christians, we're going to step on the toes, love to judge people and tell them that they can't do things right, that when you come to church, you need to clean up, you need to dress a certain way. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Jesus says, come as you are and then go and sin no more. He brings you in with all of the dirtiness, with all of the sin, with all of the shame, and then he, wow, he removes your filthy garments and clothes you in spotless white. The blood has washed you clean. You are not charged. You are saved. You are saved. God, God has removed the legal charges against you and brought you into the fold of glory. Banishing sin because only he could do it on the cross And here's the fun part. Only he gets to do it on judgment day. And Jesus is your intercessor. Standing in the gap for you when things are charged against you. And he says, no, they're already clean. No, they're already clean. No, they're already saved. No, you can't have them. No, I've already paid their debt. No, I've already bought their soul. I've already paid the price. I've already died for them. I've already killed their sin. I've already destroyed their sin. And they are raised to life with me. God. Man. I wish y'all would get excited. Show me. All right, let's wrap it up. Y'all come on. Smooth. So the, the false prophets, uh, verse 10, these people blaspheme all they do not understand. And they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. The false prophets trivialize everything about God and the Holy Spirit because they have rejected him. So they abuse it into a license for licentiousness. They tell you it doesn't matter how you live. They tell you you can keep sinning. They tell you God doesn't care about your sin. He already paid the price. Yes, he did, but that doesn't give you the authority to keep abusing it. Destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. the lights what did Satan show up as in the garden a serpent and they are tempted to be like God which is what Satan tried to do to be like God he wanted to be better than God he wanted his throne above God 
So the serpent comes in and he makes them sin. And what does this do? It makes them like animals. It makes us like animals. It makes us like wild beasts. What do animals do? They just go after their primal desires. Their primal instincts. They go after whatever they want. If they want to go eat something, they're going to go eat that thing. If they want to go mate, they're going to go mate with that thing. They're going to chase whatever desire they have. So we have been made like animals. And we are destroyed by those instincts because all of our instincts and impulses are rooted in sin. We are born into it. I am not a good person. You are not a good person. Who said amen? <laughs> what am I? None of us are good. And there's a lot of people that think they can get to heaven by just living a good life. No, you can't. You can't. You cannot do anything because God already did it for you. That takes the responsibility off of you. So get rid of your God complex thinking you can be good and just accept that I am a sinner, you are a sinner, we're in this together, he already paid the price, he already died for sin, <clears throat> he already removed it. So what do we do now? Luke 9, 23, please. If anyone would come after me, let him... Let him, 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 let him deny yourself, not affirm yourself, not promote yourself, not elevate yourself, not prop yourself up not think you're good, not think you're great, not try to make a good name for yourself, not try to change people into who you want them to be, not try to change you into who you want you to be. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. 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 That's crazy that that word doesn't look like once a week. That's crazy that that means every day. I know, shocking. English class 101. That's crazy that that doesn't say on Christmas and Easter. That's crazy that that doesn't say come on Mother's Day. That's crazy that that doesn't say drag your husband on Father's Day. Hopefully the church will have a raffle and bring some tools and get that man a Milwaukee so he can quit living in sin with DeWalt and have some real tools. I am biased. I have worked with several for a long time. Milwaukee. If it ain't red, it needs to be dead. Not craftsmen either. It's got to have Milwaukee. Take up your cross daily. Daily, guys. Daily. How do we do that? How do we quit being spiritual squatters and being lazy little lackluster Christians doing nothing for the kingdom? Because if we're not expanding it, we're not uh, empowering it, we're not providing anything to it, we're just dead weight holding it back. I don't want that in this house. That doesn't mean just go and run off because you got convicted. That doesn't mean just go and run off because you don't like the message. That doesn't mean just go and run off Jesus said, if you have a problem, this is not, no oh man. Holy Spirit. If you have a problem with someone, go and talk to them. He didn't say go cower in a corner. He didn't say be silent. He said, go and talk to them.
we think, we think family is just nothing. We are in the body of Christ. We are a community. We are one body. We are a family. But since our impulses and our desires are rooted in sin, like we do in our natural family where we don't want to invite everybody to Thanksgiving and we don't want to invite everybody to Christmas and we don't want to go over to their house because their kids are crazy. And we don't want to bring them over to our house because their kids play with all of our kids' toys and then they break stuff and they leave a big mess and they leave and they leave all the dirty dishes. I don't really want to hang out with them, but we'll send them a card on Mother's Day. We'll send them a card on Christmas and then we'll just do that. And we apply that to our Christian faith. And we wonder why people fall off and we do nothing to go after them and pull them like a brand out of the fire. We watch people just slip out and run off and we don't go and chase them down and say, come back home. They get misled, they get deceived and then they fall away. So we need to go after them. We need to take our cross daily and follow Jesus. We have to do something daily. We have to deal aggressively with the sin that is in our life. We need to pray. We need to praise. We need to read. not out of anger. I'm animated out of love and passion and urgency. This is real to me. And when it is real to you, it will move you. It will change you. It will shift you. It will make you think differently. It will wake you up and you won't be able to sin the same because now you are aware of it. This week as I was studying, I heard of a church. I think it was in the Caribbean. And they invited a popular pastor from a different church or a popular speaker. I don't exactly remember right now. They invited him to come preach at an event and a conference, whatever, at their church. The first week, they preached. he preached. Took up an offering, went back to the hotel, nothing wrong. Second day, preached, took up an offering, went back to the hotel. The third day, he preached, and when it, became, when it came time to take up the offering, he lifted up his shirt in front of everyone to show that he had a satanic symbol tattooed on his chest. He then proceeded to mock the entire body to prove to them and show them how easy it was for someone like him, a satanist, a false prophet, to slip into their midst. They lacked, like we do, discernment. Because the word gets delivered and we like DiGiorno and just eat that baby up. You put it in front of me, I'm gonna eat it up. We like that fast food faith. We don't wanna go out there and get the fresh veggies out of the garden and go slay something and put meat on the table and just sit down and feast in God's word and eat meat. We want to stay on the milk and be supplemented with a little bit of cookies, something that's sweet and just rots us out interior. Take up your cross. Deny yourself daily. Heavenly Father, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For there are those who did not get this opportunity today because they've either left this earth they've left the faith they have no home They've been led astray. 
or they live in a country where they can't do this freely and we have the opportunity to do this daily and freely let us no longer take advantage of that and just throw it to the wayside and as long as we have no more plans we'll come to church God I pray you stir up your saints this is the remnant this is the beginning of revival I pray, Lord, establish yourself back on the throne of this country. It does not matter who is voted into office. It needs to be a godly person. Yes, we need the saints to go vote because your voice counts. And the Bible says, if the unrighteous are in office, the people will mourn. The whole reason God did not want a king over Israel was because he knew that they would be led astray. And every time an ungodly person got into office, they took them further into depravity, further into sin, further into darkness. But when the right people got in there, they reestablished God at the center of the nation. And it prospered. It was blessed. And Jesus, we know that you alone are the king on the throne. Let us never forget that. I pray your word convicts these people. I pray it convicts me. God, continue to work on me and wring the sin out of my life. Establish yourself further at the center of my life. God, create in us a reverence for your holy word, a biblical literacy. God, let us follow this book and let it not just be fun little sayings. Let it teach us and shift us and transform us. Strike us at our hearts, God. to quote Paul in your word for the people who don't know if there are any lost (laughs) we pray them into the hands of the devil so that their soul is or so that their flesh is crushed and broken so that their soul will be will be made whole and be saved that's in the bible y'all that's the words of paul we can pray people into the hands of the enemy so their flesh mm, so they will be made aware of their sin and they will be broken so that they can be built back up in christ and meet us in eternity that's why we need to read the word because we hear something like that and it's, it's offensive. This is your house, God. You alone are on the throne. I pray for boldness and wisdom and knowledge and reverence for these people. I pray fire in the Holy Spirit. I pray fire, tongues of fire. I pray fire over these people, God. Stir us up. And this morning, Lord, pull people home. Pull the lost home. I pray as we do these baptisms in just a few moments that nothing but the blood can save them and they will be made aware of that fact and they will come forth and be made whole in righteousness. If that's you today, in a moment they will play a song and if you want to pray, come find me and we will pray. Come up to the altar. Be made whole. Don't wait on it anymore. You're not guaranteed a moment outside of this room. You're not guaranteed anything. You could have a heart attack in the next moment. Do not let this minute slip you by. It is that real. It is that urgent. You need to know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. You need to know that you are lost, but he has already found you. You are a sheep and you know his voice. You know he's calling you. You know he's calling you home and he is going running after you chasing you. All you've got to do is turn around and face him. Stir up your saints God and in the mighty and in the majestic and in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's worship. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. 
Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.